Well, the next 45 minutes is yours. Um, please share whatever questions, uh, ideas, comments that you may have. And we actually have uh, pretty much our entire uh, group here. So any science questions or technical questions you want, not only the people that you just uh, met through their presentations, but our other speakers are also still with us. Uh, any ideas that you may have, uh, please uh, share them with us now. Yes, please. Hello, um, Jonathan Drew at HSBC. Um, a specific issue that I think has been covered by most speakers, actually, that starts with a specific question to the uh, climate and uh, weather scientists, and thinking of the wind speeds that we saw with Mankut, uh, which, from my memory, were 200 kilometers an hour plus when they got to Hong Kong, which in turn was about 15, 20% faster than we saw uh, with Hato a year earlier. Do, do, the, do the weather and cli climate scientists, what is the prospect of those wind speeds uh, continuing to in increase? And then perhaps to the engineers, how close does that take us to the design standards of things like windows in our buildings in, in Hong Kong? And then what does that mean if we do get close to those design standards in terms of the next set of data around injuries and, and life loss in Hong Kong, business days lost? And if so, what do we do? How do we take action now to prevent some of those consequences? Well, so I think we have two types of question. One is we need a meteorologist. Uh, and the other one is we need somebody, uh, not from our team, but I know there are many of you here who are built environment experts about the standards. Um, so amongst the, um, uh, yes, but amongst the uh, uh, meteorologists, would Alexis like to have a go? <laughs> about the wind speed, right? There was a specific issue about local wind speed. Well, I guess the... Please okay. Stand. Come, come out. <laughs> I, I guess the wind speed up to this point, we, we see the uh, rising temperature. With the rising temperature, uh, looking at uh, the, the storm that hit Hong Kong already is not at their peak speed. If the, they maintain this type of uh, improve, increase in uh, wind speed, by the time they get to Hong Kong, I would still expect there would be uh, speed that is stronger than what we have seen now. But what is the limit? There must be a limit. What is the limit? I don't think we have a resolution yet. I don't know whether other colleagues in this area can, sub, uh, can have any information. But uh, the, the trend, increasing trend, I think uh, we would expect to continue a little bit. But uh, what, is, what is the uh, scientific limit? I, I don't think I have any idea. Any contribution, Ruby? Yeah, so uh, I can speak to that a little bit. So, um, in fact, uh, the, talking about the theoretical limit of tropical cyclones, uh, it is very much related to the sea surface temperature. So how warm the ocean is relative to the upper atmosphere. So the difference between the two uh, uh, create the uh, the energy for the for the tropical cyclones. So there has been quite a lot of research by Professor Kerry Emanuel from MIT, and they did actually derive that that upper limit. And we know that it is going to increase in the future, mainly because of the rising sea surface temperature. So so the wind speed that you talk about, we expect that to happen more. Frequently in the future, so the total number of tropical cyclones we don't expect to change, but the number of intense tropical cyclones we expect to increase. Yes, please. <laughs> Just one point, real quickly. The uh, it's not the uh, wind speed is not the only thing that does the damage. The uh, people compare Typhoon Mangat to the, the the Hurricane Florence in uh, the e east coast of the United States, the the uh, uh, thousand North Carolina, and that one's much lower speed and uh, did much more damage. And you know, 19 deaths uh, from the initial report. So and I guess the uh, it, it it is important to you know put all this together. Yeah, right. Did you want it to add something yeah. here? On this so, point, well, in the, in the context of of the storm, so uh, to uh, the professor's point, um, you you can have a storm that rolls through quickly, 
does a lot of wind damage and has virtually no water. I lived through Hurricane Andrew. I'm from Miami. Um, and that storm in and of itself resulted in a complete transformation in building codes in Florida because we weren't equipped for it. But at that point, the hurricane completely leveled the area that it went through with 180 mile an hour sustained winds and gusts in excess of 225 miles an hour that could have been well in excess of it, but they knocked out all of the infrastructure that could measure the wind speeds. So we actually don't know how much more than 225 it went to. That's miles per hour, by the way, not kilometers per hour. Okay, so do the math on that if you know the metric system better than I do. Um, <laughs> I'm American. I'm sorry. We fail at metric system. Uh, <laughs> that's why we created our own dumber system. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the second, so if you look at Hurricane Harvey in Houston, you have the opposite of it, where the hurricane stood over Houston and then just dumped rain, and it didn't move. And Houston gets 50 inches of rain per year. They got 50 inches of rain in one storm. And so that's a completely different set of s parameters. And then you have Florence. It's kind of a hybrid between the two. Um, the response is building codes. Uh, so in Florida, after Hurricane Andrew, we put in hurricane-proof windows as a requirement for all new structures. And then there were also some building codes related to roof, uh, roof attachments to homes and such because roofs were flying off during the storm. Uh, you don't want to be doing that afterwards. You, you have to model this out now and think about what a long-term transition to that's going to be, because the cost is going to be significantly significant where you're looking at retrofit, but you also have to make sure that all new buildings are going up thinking of that. Right, so I know there are many building engineers here. Who would like to just brief us very quickly on building codes? I'm looking at you, CS. <laughs> yes, Mr. Ho. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think there are a lot of experts within this room who can actually uh, speak with uh, greater authority than I do. But, well, as a building profession for uh, so many years, say 30 years and so on, so uh, I think i just share what I, 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 wa I want to uh, share with the room here. I, I think uh, in terms of science, I think uh, around the world, many experts already developed some sort of model, for example, simulations and so on. You know, what are the factors that can affect the, the building sort of safety? I think I heard uh, a very good uh, term uh, uh, during yesterday conference. So we're talking about not just wind, but also about say the, the water. So the water content, no? the soil actually melts and so on. So I think it's something, as you mentioned today, it's an integrated sort of system thinking. So we have to take all those, I would say, results that we already have no? o over these years regarding uh, that kind of climate change. And then we can do some sort of, <coughs> I would say, predictions. I think we are a lot of experts just to do this. I think there's no difficulty for the building profession to follow. That's to say, once you, uh, uh, this is what we say, uh, we get what, you, what we measure. So once you sow the index, you sow the parameters and so on, I think everybody will fall in. And then the government, I think, has no difficulty. How I mean, about the, the window, right? I think uh, yeah. uh, because we lost, well, some buildings lost quite a lot of windows at Mangot. The building code, right, for windows, uh, who can help us with that? Is our building code strong enough, or do we need to strengthen Hong Kong's building Well, well code? I think apart from standard, I think mm. people have to realize one thing. Uh, if you want to have something good, which can actually withstand that kind of disaster and so on, actually talk about three things all together. So the number one is the design. The number two is the user materials. The number three is the workmanship. And you can look around, the code is just the same. But some building appears to be more susceptible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Some windows seem to stand all right. this so well. So when we talk about the code, the standard, and so on, we just talk about the first thing. What is the design and also what the material use? I think everybody uses the right material. But, but perhaps if you look at one of the, uh, one of the uh, I would say, the building, a serious attacked by, the, by, by that sort of problem is, I think just one weakness can actually destroy a lot of window. I, I believe just one of them breaks. And then actually the, the, the day bit actually fall, and the wind will use it as a bullet, and then, I mean, uh, uh, suit on the other windows. So in other words, you're not making the, uh, I mean, just one or two windows uh, to cope with the cold, but everyone. Okay. So we talk about certification now. We talk about the verifications. I think one of the trouble is we have a standard with the cold, 
But afterwards, everybody claim I do it, right? But at the end of the day, whether they actually do it right in terms of the design, in terms of the workmanship material, I think we have to put in more, I would say, verification process right. in the system so that we know that nobody can escape at the end of the day, that everybody will sell policy. But, but it seems like that the building code is all right because the vast majority of our buildings, the windows are fine. Uh, so then it's, I believe so. It's, so it's down to, <laughs> down to the other points. Even stronger, higher, yes. Than that's the right. Mancun. You haven't been that's right. The Andrew yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, any other questions, comments? Uh, Mike Kilburn from the Airport Authority. Just a question on the, um, the the failure of weather gauges prompted me to remember that in our last typhoon, the sea level weather gauges failed at several stations, and of course for the airport this is important because. Sea incursion into the airport is a serious matter, and we know that it failed somewhere above 2.9 meters at Cheplau Cock, but um, at other levels at other stations. I wonder if there's someone from the observatory or makers of equipment who know why it might have caused that and what can be done about it so we can accurately measure um, storm surge in the future. Anyone can enlighten and answer this very specific question? Because if not, we can probably find somebody to answer that question after this, after this conference. Anyone? No. Let's move on to other thoughts that you may have. Yes. Um, John Chai um, from BEC, um, wearing a different hat today. Um, uh, one of the one of the actions that you've highlighted, Christine, and through discussion with the with the panel is is the multilateral action at the government level. And we knew, we knew that uh, a little while ago, we at the government level, we have a key action being undertaken uh, to establish task force and whatnot. So, so learning from recent experience, okay, can someone from government update us on, on what is happening at, at the government level regarding multi-department actions and whatnot? Thank you. Um, may I ask CEDD to share with us some of the work that you're doing? You're leading a uh, study within government on uh, the infrastructure side. And then I think we have the uh, steering committee chaired by the chief executive. Maybe uh, uh, Mr. Jay can share, share that with us. Well, uh, I think uh, one, one important thing is uh, information. So uh, CEDD is uh, now helping uh, Security Bureau to develop a platform, which is called COP, Common uh, pic Operational Picture, uh, which share we share among the uh, various uh, rescue department regarding the landslide information, uh, traffic condition, flooding, tree fall, etc. We hope we can launch the uh, platform. I think in 2020, so we can have a uh, first-hand information to help people to 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 the rescue team. Well, I think it's important right now. Right, I think on Saturday, well, uh, uh, Mr. Wong, our policy secretary, well, uh, has already mentioned that well, within the government, uh, the chief secretary for administration uh, is chairing a steering committee uh, to coordinate well, all the matters well, concerning well, climate change. Yeah. And actually, the committee well, uh, uh, has pulled together well, all the bureau uh, secretaries as well as the well, heads of departments together because well, climate change was well, an issue which crossed all the policy uh, areas, yeah. And this well, Typhoon Mancourt actually well, uh, has well, uh, uh, given us many lessons, yeah. And as well, Christine has said that, uh, as you have observed, I think well, the preparation, I think, is quite good because I think uh, because our Hong Kong Observatory, they make very good focus and all the well, uh, departments well, uh, will gear up well, to prepare for the coming of the Typhoon, yeah. But we found that, well, uh, the damage well, caused by this typhoon well, uh, uh, has never well, been happened before in, in this city. And therefore, the aftermath, well, uh, we have encountered a lot of uh, problems and issues. Well, I think some of the well, uh, trees well, in some areas well, has not been cleaned up well, even as, as today. Well, it may take well, uh, several months to do so. And therefore, well, uh, the chief said that uh, the chief executive has assigned that well the uh, secretary for security, yeah, to take a good review 
or of uh, the preparation or the handling and the aftermath of uh, this typhoon incident. And we believe we will be learning a lot more from it there. Yeah. And as to, I think, design codes, et cetera, well, I think uh, a colleague from CDD has already mentioned that, well, uh, they have a, a, a manual on that. And I think in the future, well, if we get more information and more lessons, well, I, I think the review process will be a continuous process. Yeah, and thank you. Any other questions maybe for government for further clarification or any other issues? Yes, Andy. I, <coughs> I'm not sure with when I got introduced. I'm uh, from the nonprofit NGO sector. So uh, I run, founded in an organization called Tree People, which is uh, uh, working to work with government, but really uh, engage and inform and uh, support responding, uh, which I implied. And I just wanted to underscore what you touched on in a really big way, which is the role of philanthropy. Um, you know, the definition of philanthropy is the shortest distance between pain and suffering and solution. Uh, government is slower to respond, but as humans, uh, our job is to open our hearts when we sense pain and suffering. It takes much longer time for institutions, especially in government, to to sense and respond to the need where philanthropy can fill that gap very quickly. Thankfully, and I, as a visitor guest here, uh, I'm so impressed of philanthropy's role in supporting this, uh, this conference uh, and the growth of the universities around town. But I really want to underscore, thank those of you who are here and encourage you to reach out to your peers who aren't here, those in the philanthropy community. Because you really can, as, uh, as was said, but it just needs to be underscored, this catalytic investment to be sensors of where are the gaps, where does it need, need to be filled, and you've got partners across the room, but uh, thank you for being here. Uh, your, your role in advancing uh, and stimulating a more rapid response cannot be underestimated. Thank you. Anyone else, or perhaps any of our overseas speakers from different parts of the world? Anyone? Yes? Yes. So climate change is the, is the greatest challenge that we as a, as a species have faced and are likely going to face. And so I wonder 100,000 years from now when our future generations of whatever species exist on this planet look back on us, if they're going to look back on us the way we look back on Cro-Magnon and other species of human um, existed, um, and they're going to tell the story of how we either uh, overcame this challenge or succumbed to it. And my hope is, is that in telling the story of how we overcame it, that we found a way to evolve in how we function as societies, as institutions. And I think that story of opportunity starts with uh, places like Hong Kong that are uniquely positioned to be leaders because of the intersection of cultures and, uh, and, and societies that exist within, which enable a sort of collaboration that, that is much more difficult to take place elsewhere. Uh, I've said this a couple of times this weekend, Hong Kong is a place where East meets West um, in a way that happens nowhere else in the world. I live in Miami, which is a place where North America and South America meet in a way that happens nowhere else in the world. And that means those are opportunities for Hong Kong uh, to come forward, not just in embracing its own challenges and opportunities, but also helping everybody around and to be the beacon of that sort of leadership. Um, there's an immense amount of wealth here, not just of financial wealth, but of intellectual wealth, of, of human capital wealth. And that opportunity to be a beacon of light here is one that should not be ignored. And so when I think about the slides that you presented uh, on the, uh, the Greater Bay Area Collaborative, I would even extend it beyond that to what is the role that Hong Kong can have in global leadership here in convening stakeholders across this continent and in going down into Australia um, and uh, as, a, as an epicenter. And I think that is an amazing <laughs> opportunity, but it's gonna require one for folks to look down at organizational silos and boundaries and say, yes, we need to maintain our capacity to govern and lead, 
but we also need to maintain a capacity to make the sum greater than the whole, the, the, the whole of the, I'm sorry, the whole greater than the sum of the parts. We have to stop functioning as sum of parts. And that's the opportunity that sits before us. Thank you. Mike? Thank you. It's a very nice lead up to, to my question, which I would like to focus, see if we have some time today to figure out how can the owners of big public and infrastructure assets talk to each other and talk to government to strengthen our overall adaptation and resilience. I think that's a very big and open topic. Obviously, as the airport, we have systems for planning, managing, and recovering from typhoons. But we also need to properly understand the risks at a, a systemic level, for example, with the power companies, with the railway company, with the, um, the other provision providers of assets, town gas, the bus companies, and so on. So um, I know that the, just coming into this conference, that was one of the key objectives, was to see what platforms or ideas for further collaboration may come forward. So just would be very interested to hear of I mean, others in Hong Kong, either from government or the private sector, who would be interested to, to work together to try and set out a framework and then begin addressing some of these issues. Um, this is actually a question that had been put to me at different times, both before the conference, during the conference, and now after the conference. You know, we live in a very tight town, and we kind of know everybody, um, but it seems like key stakeholders, both in and out of government, are calling for what Mike has just asked for. But we have everybody's telephone numbers. Right. So what is it that you need? Um, because I've always thought that you all have amazing convening power. I mean, if Mike called up and said, you know, this is the airport, you've got to come and talk to us, you know, we, we want to make things better, and I'm going to call up the power companies, I'm going to call up the government, and we'll all have a meeting, I'll be the first one to put my hand up and say, okay, I'm there. So what is it that you need? Uh, what is it that... Uh, uh, why is that not happening? How can we make that happen? Because you are all here. Um, I think in the, um, in the discussions in the workshop, one of the uh, points that came up was our organizations are all very big. Everyone has a different role to play. And quite often, the decisions that need to be made for a certain topic would lie with another colleague or another area. And, we don't know all the colleagues and even our own organizations sometimes. So somehow we have to figure out how to get the right people together with the other right people counterparts so maybe there is more synergies as, as uh, uh, Daniel had mentioned. Um, that's first. And I think secondly, uh, how to empower the experts, how to empower the experts in making decisions sometimes because quite often, you know, we are in a very... Um, hierarchical society, and there is this ex uh, expectation that all decisions have to go back up to the top and you know, be made sure that it's, it's, it's sound and it's kosher. But then, you know, in moments of urgency, the best person who knows the answer actually is probably the best person to make that decision instead of necessarily waiting for someone else to say, yes, this is the right recommendation. That's another point. Um, but the third one, I thought um, also going back to you know, you were saying convening power, but I think also it's the knowledge, the knowledge sharing is very important. And I think, number one, we want to have more opportunities for more platforms so that the right people can come together. But even more important, we need the right information to be prepared ahead of those discussions, that people have had the time to actually go through information that probably required years of research and this is where I think um, in Hong Kong, we probably need to go back to look at how academia's role can support a lot of this decision making that needs to be done, and which is why I think it's great that HKUST has convened this conference. Any other comments here? Because I think this is a kind of common problem, right? For, for all of us. Yeah, I'm Evan Tong, I'm Director of Drainage Services. Um, actually, I want to make uh, another comment here. Um, people always think of oh, disasters are bad, okay? It's really ironic to say that we take some positive effect from any disasters such as typhoons. But we do have something here. Um, we have two typhoons, super typhoons, Hato 
and my uncle in two consecutive years. I just look at my own experience. Um, I was at um, Tai O, a lower lying area in Lantau, and uh, before the, the last typhoon, had to hit Hong Kong. Uh, people who know um, Tai O is a low lying area in Lantau, and we have built, a CED that helps us to build a seawall to protect village houses there. But whenever there is forecast of uh, typhoon coming because of the sea level rise, we have to put in additional 500, 500 millimeters demountable sea um, flood walls on top of the concrete sea walls. But even that process needs a lot of help or cooperation from local villages. There are gaps that we need someone to um, uh, evacuate their properties and put some um, water barriers up there so that the whole um, street is being protected like a polder scheme. Before Hato came, I went there, and not everyone are so cooperative. But after Hato, oh, everyone knows that this is very important. So I won't go to the extent to say that this is a blessing in disguise. I mean Typhoon Hato. But it did help us to prepare better for Mangut. I was there on Saturday. Mangut hit on, on Sunday. Everyone in Tai is geared up because of the experience, the bad experience of Hato. They are very cooperative to us building the additional demountable flood barriers to protect their village, okay? And the point I want to make is this Typhoon Mangut, uh, or Typhoon Hato especially, has raised public awareness on disaster, on how to prepare better for ourselves. Our colleagues said that um, uh, uh, we are better prepared uh, for the Typhoon Mangut. I think it's better prepared because of Typhoon Hato, the bad experience of Hato. And so I'm quite optimistic that we people in Hong Kong are learning fast. We learn from each disaster. After the experience of Mangut, we understand the COP is being set up. We have a, a review on our aftermath uh, um, system, how to deal with this emergency. I, I think um, your problem, Mike, I think you can talk to everyone now and everyone is, is going to listen to you and try to solve each other's problem. <laughs> we don't really need a platform. You, you, you can call up CLP, you can call us up, you can call up um, HKO, and I think everyone is going to cooperate because of the experience of Mangut. So I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that um, in a society like Hong Kong, we learn from experience. We, we try to do better, even, even if the typhoon which is stronger than Mangut, I don't think we have a very big problem because um, what we learned from this particular experience here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, so I mean, I, I got from that that uh, the learning is very deep and um, we need to be better organized right? and ask the quite right questions of the right people. But I see uh, a number of hands. Can I show one, two, three, Four, five. I'm going. Let's give a chance. Six. All right. Uh, can I have people who haven't spoken? Yes. Please, Winston, who's yes. come from Singapore and was a speaker at our conference. Yes. Please. Morning, everyone. Is this on? Yep. Uh, I'll say a few things about maybe the Singaporean perspective of how we try to address issues of climate change. I'm from the National University of Singapore. Um, th thanks again for inviting me to speak at this conference. Uh, I'll say three things. One is uh, to rebut maybe uh, Daniel's point about Hong Kong being a global city. I think some Singaporeans might disagree with that. <laughs> I have to stand up for my country. Yeah. In <laughs> okay, uh, but we share similar things. While we, we aren't exposed to the sort of severe storms like what everyone here in Hong Kong has been subject to, we are also subject to other similar issues uh, pertaining to coastal cities, sea level rise and extreme heat. Now, um, one thing that hasn't been stressed enough so far, I think, is that time is limited. Urgent action needs to be done. Urgent action needs to be coordinated at multiple levels. And I'll give two examples of work that I've been involved in in Singapore to that particular end. Uh, I'm leading a research, a sort of um, multi-stakeholder initiative trying to cool Singapore, coolingsingapore.sg. Uh, that's the sort of proje uh, the project. More information on that project, you can look at that website. But 
what we are what we're trying to stress is we're trying to re reduce uh, the urban heat exposure both from severe uh, heat events and from the urban heat island which Hong Kong is also subject to uh, we find that a lot of the methods the approaches both engineering and nature-based solutions are already there what isn't present, however, is the coordination between agencies. So previous speakers have mentioned about the need to think beyond silos, to think across disciplines, to coordinate your actions. There is impetus at the top, at the Singaporean level, to understand this environmental issue. There is impetus from the bottom, but most often times the entrenched level of resistance in terms of applying these concepts, be it engineering or be it green infrastructure, lies in the middle. There's a lot of thinking that you know, says like, this is not my problem. It doesn't add on to my key performance indicator. But I think once we address that through either communication, through education, that can be resolved and that can be resolved quickly. That's what we're doing in Singapore. The second thing is that other industries within cities, um, be it aviation, be it um, um, transportation in, um, through, through maritime industries and so on, they have to get on board as well. But one industry that hasn't been mentioned so far is tourism. Lots of people come to Singapore to visit uh, for tourist uh, you know, purposes, same in Hong Kong as well. But I think that people from these industries that may not have been you know, highlighted often in, in terms of climate, you know, climate change adaptation, climate change resilience, they have to come on board as well. In the Singaporean perspective, uh, one of the key attractions is the zoo, um, the agency that manages that, uh, Mandai Park Developments. They put their money where their mouth is. They put in... A, close to uh, half a million dollars for academic research pertaining to sustainability, pertaining to environmental awareness, pertaining to climate change. Uh, they approach academics like myself to lead this sort of um, um, applied research towards how do we best address knowledge to our visitors who come to Singapore to visit these sort of parks, to visit the zoo, to let them learn more about climate change, not just for Singapore, but at, from a global perspective as well. So there is that link encouraging um, encouraging actions that are aware of the urgency of all climate change within Singapore that maybe uh, folks here can learn and similarly we can learn from you all as well okay so yes well, we complete with you. each other but that we're going to yeah. educate our visitors what a good idea <laughs> Thank you, Christine, and everybody. So my name is Ben McQuay, and by day I'm a lawyer, but I'm here to speak just a few moments about the uh, Hong Kong Green Finance Association, which Christine very kindly plugged uh, a moment ago. Um, as, as people will be aware, the carbon reduction commitments that governments made in Paris in 2015 will cost trillions and trillions of dollars. And as you may also be, may be aware, governments themselves can afford just a small fraction of the cost of the, uh, of, of the cleanup. And so therefore, mobilizing the private sector through the international financial centers is, is a huge and important uh, imperative. And so our uh, Green Finance Association exists in good part to try to help mobilize, to try to help educate private capital in uh, this very important area. And although we have a, a, a large number of tasks and objectives, one of them is, and one of them that's relevant directly to this discussion is how we create a greener financial system in Hong Kong. Now, you may be surprised to know that one of the greatest challenges that we currently have is pipeline. I.e., there's not enough investable qualifying project, projects and products. And so, I don't have a question for you. It's more of an RFP. And that is, to the extent that you have ideas, you have thoughts, you don't know how to structure, you don't know how to fund, you know, get in touch with us because we might be able to help you because we all need to collaborate, which I think is a message entirely consistent with previous speakers. Thank you. There were some, some hands at the back of people who haven't spoken. Yes. Uh, someone who hasn't spoken. Yes. 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 Okay. Well, I'm just trying to, yes, yeah, no, 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 I'm just trying to make sure. Okay, so we have Robert and then Thomas. Robert, please. Thank you, Robert Gibson, at UST. Um, how far in the future should we look when we plan major infrastructure developments? For instance, when you put in a new 
uh, MTR line. I'm told that the sort of payback period on that sort of investment to make sense is something like 100 years. But if you put it into a, a new area of the territory and that leads to a town, what sort of length, what duration into the future should we be looking at for that? And then that comes to the question of what uh, scenarios on sea level rise should we be planning for if we are going to do, a, as is proposed, have a major development, which I personally support very strongly, I think it's a great idea, a major development on an artificial island between here and Lantau Island. Um, how do we address that problem? How far do we look in the future? One possibility is say, well, look, we, we know sea level rise is going to happen. We don't know how quickly. So let's do a scenario planning. Let's do a scenario planning for something which is a pretty high level and see how would we cope for that and then have that built into design. I'd be really interested if anybody's got any comments on that. Well, I think this is the sort of thing that CEDD will have to do. Is that right? <laughs> don't know whether you want to talk a little bit about the process right, of... Uh, Will you be able to share something with us? Well, <laughs> actually, I'm not an expert on this aspect, but I, my thing, uh, we, we uh, should have set setting up a team to uh, look after this uh, kind of issue, uh, different scenario, including an uh, uh, increase in sea, in sea level, because it will affect the subsequent works, including our design standard, etc. And, well, uh, perhaps I can share with you my expert area in the landslide. You know, uh, in 2008, we have experienced a very severe storm on Lantau Island. I think uh, one of the speakers have mentioned before. And looking back, uh, you can't rely, really rely uh, on the government ad adaptation measure. That, that is the engine measure. We have to give up our community. So uh, the trend is like that. Uh, we would like to have uh, some, uh, some kind of uh, innovation technology, try to use this. Uh, to, to have a lens, for example, a lens eye detection system to set up an early warning so as to mobilize the community to give them the first hand information. And we are going to uh, educate our community the self help tips, uh, not solely rely on the rescue team, but we can help each other, the neighbors, the community itself. So I think this is the trend of the government approach on this aspect. Um, I think that's a really important statement because some of the government departments have already embarked on not just the hard engineering, but a total package that engages more people in education and so on. But I think Robert's question, it's, and it's all right not to answer it today, because I think what Robert is really saying is, if you're going to reclaim anything, make sure you take care of sea level rise, and sea level rise might be more or faster than we think. I think that's what's behind Robert's uh, uh, question. Yes. Maybe I can supplement a bit. Um, because of AR5, the new forecast of the temperature, the effect on sea level rise, both our department and CEDD colleagues have uh, revised our manuals. Our manuals is the stormwater drain uh, design manual. CEDD has a um, port work um, design manual, which deals with the sea level rise and how we design um, um, sea walls, uh, levels, and so on. And not even that, uh, because of the mangot, our two departments are also looking at um, the effect of mangot. Uh, one would realize that apart from heavy rain, storm surge, we do have some, a third problem. Um, that problem did exist in Hato, but not as severe as in mangot. It's the overtopping wave effect. Um, in areas like uh, Hang Fa Chin, South Horizon, and some other areas, the sea level has not risen to overtop the seawall, but the wave did. The waves sometimes are three stories high, and they hit on the ground and destroy the promenade and so on and so, so forth. And I understand the CED colleagues is now working on a consultancy to look at the coastal area, how we are going to deal with storm such as um, these, these effects, uh, overtopping wave effect and sea level rise as well. That's why I said that we are all learning from each incident and we are trying to do better for the next one. Okay. Um, I, I think the other thing is, and don't forget what the director of uh, the Hong Kong Observatory said on the day one, on the 22nd, on the 27th. He, he actually said that we were lucky with Mangrut because the prediction was in fact much worse 
but it didn't hit us as severely. So I would imagine that within government, these uh, estimations are all taken into account when they are now thinking about setting standards for new infrastructure. Anyway, the directors are all nodding their heads. So, <laughs> so what, maybe a, a two last question comments because we're hitting 11.30. Thomas and, uh, we'll, we'll, Thomas, and then we'll finish with Natalie. Thank you. That, thanks, Christine. Um, I'll be real quick on this. Um, I may have given you the impression that I work for a foundation, but I, I actually don't work for a foundation. But in facilitating the workshop, I learned an awful lot about what foundations and philanthropy uh, do. So there's two points ready. Um, one, to speak to the gentleman's point about sustainable finance. Actually, um, foundations will uh, sponsor and will fund uh, certain projects. I mean, there's always the impression that foundations have deep pockets, uh, which is partly true, as I found out in my research. But the fact of the matter is that uh, an alarming statistic was that only 2% of global philanthropy is spent on climate change. And um, I think part of the reason underlies for the, a lack of um, um, understanding and also lack of presentation in terms of you know, what the projects that are being presented to foundations. So it does, really does rely on that, that level of understanding to, to bring people together and um, you know, connect in the right way. The second point, uh, real quick, is this thing about climate literacy. I think it's great that all of us in this room here, and we have a, a very um, common, understand, common point of understanding about climate change, but outside of this room, I would challenge that there's, there's not a lot of people who uh, share this, this, this understanding, uh, except for the point that a gentleman from DSD made, when um, your house gets flooded, then you know all about climate change. So I think, you know, if, if this one actually speaks to the role of philanthropy, because really it's a very natural extension of what type of work they do in terms of education, public awareness, and humanitarian um, kind of, kind of um, development. And uh, uh, picking up on, on Richard's and Daniel's point there, boy, I wish we had a community like LA and, and Miami, because from what the tales you told me, especially Richard, from the early tales of, of uh, what happened in Los Angeles, when communities suddenly realized they had a problem and got together, that really opened doors and opened hearts. Um, I have an invitation for, for everyone here. Um, in the last two days in our group discussing about the potential impact and additional impact of climate change on the vulnerable groups on the underprivileged community. So thinking about people living in subdivided flat uh, apartments, like in a, vo in, a much, uh, in a small confined space facing more, uh, more extreme heat and more extreme cold, thinking about the more frequent storm and more, um, more severe via rainfall, like the impact on shelter homes on rooftop and so. So we feel in our, in our group that we don't have enough understanding like about the issues, about the impact on these underprivileged community. And we just know that they have less resources on hand like when they face these kind of challenges to try to remedy the situation, the aftermath of it. So um, we, there are like quite a passion within the team, a few of us, wanting to go beyond the conference, wanting to explore more, whether through research to understand more about these issues. So if there are academics in the room that you would be interested to have a dialogue to work together, um, I would love to chat with you. Or if we have, um, we of course need funding for this kind of research. So if we have philanthropy fu uh, funds here, like I would also love to speak with you. So it's an invitation for everyone that like we feel there would be an opportunity for multi-stakeholder engagement, a dialogue to try to explore these areas, to to try to help the underprivileged community to become more competent, more resilient in facing the climate impact. Well, I can completely conceive of a project where we can already use existing knowledge about weather, climate change, risk, and so on, that could be funded by the foundations that could be taken to the community. The vulnerable groups never come to gatherings like this. And I think we do have the responsibility to consider how to outreach to them. And we need to work with other people in the community um, who, who are in touch with them. So thank you, Natalie. If there are no final comments, then uh, I'd like, oh, CS? OK. From Beam Society, built environment expert. From uh, being, a, I would say, just a member of the community, I think we are talking all about, about I mean, prevention and, and so on and so forth. I think, uh, actually, we are talking about the maintenance of the city and also the development of the city or the community. Uh, we, we perhaps emphasize so much on the proactive approach, 
But I think today we have to think about the reactive even more. The reason is very simple. The whole thing actually changed too quickly. Just now you mentioned about the standard. No matter how the new standard is good enough, as I mentioned, but they only take care of the new buildings and the new built environment. Mm. But what about the old one? Actually, they are actually at the back. So no matter how good you are, so some, somewhere, somehow, they will fail. So rather than thinking about how we prevent the whole thing, raising these and that, I think we'll take, take, think about the reactive measure. For example, uh, you talk at the internet world and so on. You can see that everybody seems to be working uh, on their own cell, but there are some sort of unseen hand, which is what I say, the coordination. So we're talking about coordination at, at different level. Now, for example, if, whenever there's any disasters happen, uh, I, I heard about the television interview on the one the old lady living in Lei Yunbun. And people, the reporters say, why don't you go? Oh, no problem, right? Whenever I problem, I just call the police. They will come. Now, that is a problem. Because they're too passive, they over rely on one single authority, just for the sea to save you, or God to save you. It doesn't work, no, nowadays. So you have to rely on all sorts of, I would say, mobilization of resources, as mentioned by the, the speaker, how. For example, if we mention about the roles of different groups. For example, CS, you're going to take care of not, not just your wife, your children and so on, but what about the next door, the, 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 the elder ladies? So once something happens, and then once you blow the whistle, and then the whole thing will work. So at the end of the day, it's still the well-being of the people. And we want to protect the poverty, but so much more to protect the people. But if we have good coordination, good definition of the roles, and then who to make the decision, and also the information center resources and so on. Now before the manga, you can see that a lot of advice through the internet, my wife actually using that kind of plastic web no, for food, uh, to put on the window. I say, Winnie, what you're doing? He said, well, according to the, uh, the uh, I, I got a video, he said, putting something, I say, it is so plastic, how can you hold the, uh, the, the, the glass? If someone hit the glass, it broke, the plastic cannot hold it. So all sorts of rumor around the city. So I think what the government can do is actually to give information. And then I would say uh, mobilize the, the majority. Wow, there's nothing happened. I think we have to get prepared for the worst. Uh, no way we can prevent anything. As an engineer, I tell you what, I've been asked, right? Mr. CSO, can you guarantee you know, about the reliability, for example, the lift and so on? I say, as a scientist, an engineer, I tell you what, it will fail. <laughs> it will fail. But I just try to reduce the frequency, that's all, and yeah. also the impact. But not just the engineering solution. Right. I think human yeah. solution is even more important. I'm so glad to hear about, say, the Los Angeles sort of uh, experience. I say, yes, I think that is a solution. Well, thank you so much, because I think you've reminded us of the old areas in Hong Kong, not the new buildings where the codes are very old. There, uh, this notion of how we can help each other, you know, and also the spread of news sometimes through the internet is not correct. And <laughs> you know, this bit about putting right things on the window, we know that that's not actually the right thing to do. Uh, and I think we also have property development companies who are managing uh, buildings, how to reach out to, you know, who can reach out to different uh, stakeholders and communities and families in, in society. So it is quite complex. Uh, who can act? Obviously, many, many people can act. So I hope, uh, if nothing else, we've triggered some thinking and that you could take through your own channels and network what you could do. I think government is thinking about many, many things right now. Maybe better connections. I think, Edwin, despite you know your willingness to take a lot of calls, you actually still hear major stakeholders like the airport, the railway, uh, the, the, the utilities actually saying they like to talk more. So what are some of those platforms that could be created soon uh, for enhanced discussion? And I think on behalf of HKUST uh, and the academic scientific community in Hong Kong at other universities, I'm sure there's more that we can do to organize our knowledge in a way that could be more easily shared. And I'm delighted to hear from the philanthropic sector that they might fund some of this. So let's see what we can do going forward. And at HKUST, we will continue to see how we can work with all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you for government uh, to be our partner. <laughs>